Hello, 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 we welcome you today. Hi, everybody, how's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, um, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and basically try to create a character that is both very fun, but also very powerful to play in-game. If you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and we are super happy to have you. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. So I've had a lot of requests over the last several months, especially, uh, to do a Swarm Keeper Ranger build. And I think today is the day that I finally take that plunge. The Swarm Keeper is a really cool, fun character concept, I think, uh, with some neat things that you can do both for damage and also for control and utility. What really got me interested in making a build for a Swarm Keeper, though, was when I realized how perfectly the Swarm Keeper actually pairs with another request that I've often had, and that is to do a character focused on using a sling for a weapon. The sling is super thematic, super cool. I mean, there's definitely something appealing, right, about being David versus Goliath, being this little unassuming shepherd, spoiler alert, who fells their foes with little more than, you know, a bit of leather, a rock, and their faith, I suppose. But the thing about the sling is, like the whip and the dart, are oft considered uh, lowly weapons in the world of D&D. Because their damage die is so low, it's only a 1d4, most people think of them, I think, as suboptimal choices. Depending on what you're trying to do in game, you can very often just use a different weapon for the same effect, but more damage, right? Why go with a d4 when you could go with a d6 or a d8? But sometimes, I think, if you think about it hard enough, you really can use these oft maligned weaker weapons for really fun and powerful character builds. I had some fun with a whip build a few weeks ago, but I think the best example that I've actually done to date with this idea is with my needler build, uh, which was a dart thrower, actually. And to be honest with you, I have yet to create a character that did more burst damage, at least at early levels, than the needle or the, the simple dart thrower. And frankly, the dart is like an absolutely necessary aspect of that build. It wouldn't have worked as well with any other weapon. And I love that. It makes me shiver with delight. <laughs> the key, I think, with trying to optimize these weapons is in finding out like what's unique about them. What can they do that no other weapon can despite the lower damage die? And then finding a way to build around that uniqueness to create a character that really is like at their absolute best with that weapon. I don't just want to create a character who is a ranged weapon user and then like give him a sling because hey, slings are cool and I'm okay doing less damage so long as I can use the weapon that I want to for thematic purposes. No, not good enough. I want to build a character that just wouldn't be nearly as good with any other weapon so that they can be the best they can be, not in spite of the fact that they're using a sling, but because they're using a sling. You know what I mean? So that's our goal today. We need to figure out what's unique about the sling and then build a character around that uniqueness. And so, preamble over, I proudly present episode 61, the humble yet powerful Swarm Keeper Slingshot. But first, of course, I wanted to give a little shout out and a little plug to the sponsor for this week's video, Elder Brain and their new book, Crown of the Oathbreaker. All right, guys, so this is a 500 page D&D 5e adventure module for characters level 5 through 12. It's also compatible with Pathfinder, but it's actually much, much more than that. So it's a larger campaign setting, but it also features dozens of new monsters, encounter maps, subclasses. There are three new subclasses for each existing class in D&D. It's got new feats, new spells, new magic items. They are looking for backing on their Indiegogo page, which I'm going to link to in the video description as always. And it actually looks like they're well past their initial goal already, so they're doing very well. The adventure itself is like a dark fantasy 
sandbox adventure. It has over 30 dungeon maps, three regional maps with over 100 locations on each, taking characters from a cursed kingdom all the way to the Fey Realm. Um, I've actually spent a fair bit of time scouring their Indiegogo page, as well as the adventure summary and some other material that they've sent me. And just the adventure itself looks like a super fun romp with a healthy dose of like the creepy and macabre just in time for Halloween. One of the coolest things about the project actually is that they have this free mobile app. It's called Elder Brain Soundscapes with over a dozen dynamically generated non-repetitive background ambiances for many of the locations found in the adventure. And I love this so much. I really do. I'm not sure about you guys, but like when we are playing, we're often enhancing our own games with like background music or ambient sound uh, when we're not recording, at least. And I think it really adds a ton to sort of the feel of the game. So having something custom designed for the adventure that you're playing, super cool. So be sure to check out the project. Again, um, I've got a link to it in the video description. Back them. You'll be glad you did. Thanks to everyone over at Elder Brain. And let's jump into the episode. All right. At level one. Here's the deal. With this build, we are really going to want both the archery fighting style and one specific druid cantrip. There are several ways we could go about doing this. We could take the magic initiate feat uh, to pick up the cantrip and then take the fighting style from ranger. For me, because we get so few ability score increases or feats throughout our character's career compared to character levels. And there are already two feats that I really want, not to mention ability score increases. I'm generally going to prefer taking like a level dip in another class if doing so accomplishes the same goal, so long as it doesn't require me to be multiple ability score dependent, mad. Now, we could take a fighter dip for the archery fighting style, then when we get to ranger level two, we could take druidic warrior, a new fighting style from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, that gives us two druid cantrips. Not a bad option at all. We could also take a single level cleric dip if we went nature cleric. The advantage for clerics is they get to start with three cantrips plus a druid cantrip for free, so four total, and they get proficiency with heavy armor. And besides, I've never used a nature cleric before in a build, and this is a perfect opportunity to do so. In the end, though, I think for me, my preferred route here will be to take a druid dip. There are some drawbacks. The prohibition against metal armor is one, and of course, you know, you may be able and or willing to wear metal armor on your druid. I don't want to get in a fight necessarily about whether or not you can or will be able to at your table. For some of you, this is an non-issue. For others, it matters. Now, druids only get two cantrips as opposed to the cleric's four, but there are things in druid at a later level that are more appealing to me than cleric or even fighter, actually, which I'm going to get into later. Not to mention that I think that the druid works a lot better thematically for this character. And so for all of those reasons, dipping through it here is my preferred method of accomplishing our early goals. So at level one, when we meet our character, they are naturally a lover of nature. I'm guessing that they're probably a beekeeper. They really like honey. But more than that, they have developed such an affinity for the animals that they work with and care for that their bond has grown beyond the physical and has become something more mystical and even magical. So as a race, I'm going to suggest variant human or custom lineage. I'm probably going to go custom lineage because they get dark vision. And at this point, I want to mention the artwork by my friend Randall Hampton, his character concept for this. I love that he did this turtle. I told him it was going to be custom lineage, so kind of do whatever you want, because that's kind of the point of the custom lineage, right? So I didn't want everybody to think that I was going turtle, and so that's why I waited until now to show it. It's custom lineage, at least that's my recommendation. Of course, you could go turtle, or you could do a custom lineage and make them turtle-esque. And no, they wouldn't have the other benefits that come from the turtle race, but you do get the benefits of custom lineage, and you can make them look however you want otherwise. And that, to me, is what's great about custom lineage. And that's also probably what bothers a lot of you about it. But anyway, kudos to Randall. Love this artwork. Um, love the sling. He looks like the fifth, <laughs> the fifth Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, the sling wielder Ninja Turtle. We shall call him Botticelli. So yes, custom lineage, you get a free feat. 
you get uh, plus two to an ability score. As for that free feat, for a ranged character who is focused on sustained damage per round, it's pretty tough to beat Sharpshooter for pure damage, right? So with this feat, you can elect when you make an attack with a ranged weapon to take a minus five penalty to hit, and then if you hit, you do a flat plus 10 extra damage. Taking that penalty for that benefit is almost always worth it, especially if you can find ways to add to your chance to hit. Other benefits of the feat include not suffering disadvantage when attacking from long range and ignoring half cover and three quarters cover when making ranged weapon attacks. A very, very strong feat. As for our ability scores, as always, I'm going to assume the point by method and recommend that we take a 14 in wisdom and then add our two there, so we're at 16. Uh, a 15 in constitution and a 14 in dexterity. Yes, we are going to build a sad character here, a single ability score dependent character who actually is very happy. I seem to have a bit of an affinity for wisdom based rangers, I suppose. As the last one I did, the, uh, the Fey Wanderer did the same thing, although they were melee and built quite differently. But being single ability dependent, is I think the best way to get the most out of a Swarm Keeper Ranger, as we will get into more in a little bit. For our equipment, I'm gonna recommend just taking the gold buy option and then starting with hide armor and a sling and your other necessities. I'm assuming that you cannot or will not wear metal armor. If you can and will, go ahead and grab scale mail instead. As is, our armor class is going to be pretty low. 14 with hide armor and a plus two dexterity. And it doesn't really get a lot better than that. Now, as is, I'm slightly less worried about survivability because we are a ranged character, but you are gonna be fairly squishy. So, I hope you've got a good frontline protector or tank in your party and or some support or healing. Of course, you'll get some of that yourself. So as a level one druid, we get uh, the druidic language, fun for utility and story purposes. And then we also get uh, spells, of course. So we get cantrips, we get first level druid spells. There's a lot of great ones to choose from. Guidance is always useful. Cure wounds, healing word, good berry, entangle and many more. The only one I'm going to really say we have to have is the cantrip magic stone. I've actually never talked about this spell in any other build before. It's really great in very specific instances and it is absolutely paramount to our build. So the way this spell works, as a bonus action, you touch up to three pebbles and you make them magical. You or someone else that you give them to can throw those pebbles now uh, with their arm or throw them with a sling. If you throw it, it has a range of 60 feet, surprisingly more than the slings range of 30 feet without disadvantage anyway, 120 with disadvantage, but of course we have sharpshooter, so for us it's 120 feet. So there's reason number one for using a sling, but we'll get into even more and better reasons in a minute. Now, regardless of who makes the attack with this magic pebble, mm, the magic pebble, I loved that book when I was a kid. <laughs> The attack is made with your spellcasting ability modifier to hit and to damage. Each pebble does 1d6 damage if it hits. Okay, so this is the reason, this spell is the reason that our character can be single ability score dependent. Like the melee cousin to this spell, Shillelagh, it allows us to use our wisdom modifier instead of our dexterity modifier now to make a ranged attack. That in and of itself is nice. A lot of this character's damage, as we're going to see in a few levels, is going to be dependent on a high wisdom score. So not having to choose between dexterity and wisdom is fantastic, and it allows us to do better damage than we otherwise would if we had to kind of split between them. Okay, so then why bother using a sling when we can just throw the pebble 60 feet if we wanted? I thought this was a sling build. Indeed. It absolutely is. Here's the thing. If we wanted to take advantage of, say, uh, the sharpshooter feat, as well as other features that we're going to get later, we need to be making an attack with a ranged weapon. Throwing a stone is very much not making an attack with a ranged weapon. It's making an attack with your arm. So far as I know, combining magic stone and the sling here is the only way we can both make ranged weapon attacks with 
our wisdom modifier and also then be able to take advantage of things like the sharpshooter feat, which will let us add 10 flat damage to each of those attacks. The fact that doing this allows us to make ranged weapon attacks that are also bludgeoning is unique as well and will come in handy later. Now, the biggest drawback to this spell is that it only lasts for one minute, and if you cast it on more stones uh, before you've used them all up, the other stones that were affected by it lose their magic. So there's not a great way to stockpile them, and having to spend a bonus action every time you want to make three more is a real bummer. I've heard people that are proponents of this spell talk about how they've agreed with their dungeon master that their character is sort of like constantly walking around casting this spell on some rocks in their pocket or whatever every minute so that if and when a fight does break out they don't have to take a bonus action to cast this. I don't really know why you couldn't do that necessarily. Um, the alternative literally telling your DM every 60 seconds I cast magic stone on the rocks in my pocket would be so annoying that I have to believe that most DMs would just be like okay fine. <laughs> <laughs> Your character has OCD, I get it. Let's just assume that you always have three pebbles that have the spell cast on them at all times, like when you're not sleeping or whatever. Maybe I'm wrong. Regardless, it does present just a little bit of annoyance, I suppose, in the middle of a fight, but we can deal with it. At level two, something in our character's deep heart's core has compelled them to leave their cabin of clay and wattles and the peace of their be loud glade. Perhaps there is a danger threatening the natural world that their swarm has alerted them to. Whatever the reason, we have decided to set out on an adventure, polishing up our already formidable skill with our sling, and enhancing our connection to nature in order to fight alongside her against whatever evil it is that's looming. It's time for some ranger levels. So at level one as a ranger, we get the Deft Explorer feature. This was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It replaces the Natural Explorer feature from the player's handbook and is the one that I would recommend taking as pretty much all of the Tasha's features that were introduced for rangers. It gives us some nice, mostly utility benefits, which I prefer over Natural Explorer. So at this level, Deft Explorer gives us the canny ability, which means we learn a couple new languages, that's always welcome, and we get to double our proficiency bonus for one of the skills that we're proficient in, so it works like expertise, right? I'd probably personally take perception, I think, but do what you like with that. Also introduced in Tasha's, uh, we get favored foe, which replaces favored enemy. I Again, I think it's the better option. It essentially lets you mark an enemy proficiency bonus times per day, and thereafter, so long as you maintain concentration as though you are concentrating on a spell, you can deal an extra 1d4 of damage to it once per turn when you hit it. That damage increases at 6th level and 14th level in Ranger. As for level 3, we will be a Ranger 2. And here's another one of those reasons why we want to be using a sling instead of throwing our magic pebbles. We get a fighting style at level 2, and we're going to take the archery fighting style, of course. As I've mentioned, it lets us add a plus 2 to our attacks when we attack with a ranged weapon. Voila. This makes using Sharpshooter a lot less painful. We also get spells at Ranger 2. Rangers have a fairly small spell list, but there are some good ones. I'd take Cure Wounds if you didn't get it from Druid. Hunter's Mark is a good spell for now, although we'll be using our concentration for something else later on. It lets you add a d6 of damage to your weapon attacks, thanks Sling, but it requires concentration and a lot of like bonus action usage. That's fine for now because we really only need our bonus action every three turns for magic stone because we're just making one attack per per turn so yeah go ahead and mark them up for now at level four we get primal awareness once again replacing a player's handbook feature with atasha's feature uh, it lets us learn some additional spells basically at this level it's speak with animals which gives us some nice utility and it, of course is absolutely on point thematically for this character and then of course we get our ranger subclass our ranger archetype and yes we are going with the swarm keeper here's what we read about swarm keepers feeling a deep connection to the environment around them some rangers reach out through their magical connection to the world and bond with a swarm of nature spirits 
The swarm becomes a potent force in battle, as well as helpful company for the ranger. Some swarm keepers are outcasts or hermits, keeping to themselves and their attendant swarms, rather than dealing with the discomfort of others. Other swarm keepers enjoy building vibrant communities that work for the mutual benefit of all those they consider part of their swarm. Now, of course, your swarm doesn't have to be bees. In fact, technically, we're told that they're nature spirits, right? Uh, not actual insects. Still, I like to think at least that that's maybe where your bond began. At least when I play this character, they're totally going to be a beekeeper. Mmm, honey. So, as a swarm keeper, we get a couple of features. The gathered swarm feature, first of all. So, now we have this swarm of nature spirits that fly or skitter about us. I don't like that word, skitter. I hope that doesn't freak you out. They're spirits. They're nice, right? You determine its appearance or you can roll on a table to determine it. Uh, they might be insects, they might be butterflies, ooh, or birds, or even playful pixies, which just makes me all warm and happy on the inside. In fact, maybe I start as a beekeeper, but I think my swarm might be pixies. <laughs> so once on each of your turns, this swarm can do one of three things after you hit an enemy with an attack. They take an extra d6 of damage, which is not bad and actually probably my go-to for now or they could move you five feet horizontally in a direction of your choice, or they would move the enemy that you hit 15 feet horizontally in a direction of your choice, unless that enemy makes a strength saving throw. I've mentioned this before, but this strength save is probably my least favorite thing about this ability, I think. It's generally among the stronger of the saving throws that you'll run into in most D&D encounters. Also, it's the main reason why I felt it was so important to be single ability score dependent, you know, on this character, because the higher your wisdom score, the higher the difficulty check for your enemy's saving throw here. And we'll discuss why that's important a little bit later. You also get Swarm Keeper Magic as a Swarm Keeper, which lets us learn the Mage Hand cantrip, if we don't already know it. But the hand, of course, takes the form of our swarming nature spirits, which just is like an image right out of a cartoon or something that I absolutely love. Which way am I supposed to go? Swarm says this way. Perfect, I love it. We also get some additional spells known, which is great. For us here, it's fairy fire, actually, which is, of course, really powerful. Uh, it's actually what I would probably start using, I think, at this level instead of Hunter's Mark for my concentration. Uh, even though it takes a full action to cast, it benefits your other allies as well. And having advantage, which is what Fairy Fire gives us, among other things, instead of that, you know, plus D6 damage on hit from Hunter's Mark, when you have the Sharpshooter feat, the advantage is just going to be statistically superior on all but the lowest enemy armor classes. At level 5, we are a Ranger 4. We get our first ability score increase, or feat. There is a feat that I really want, and some of you can probably guess what I would be going for here. But after crunching the numbers, I've realized that bumping our wisdom here is statistically just slightly superior to that feat. All of our damage is wisdom dependent, and raising our spell difficulty check to boot is really helpful now and critical next level. Because at level six, we're a ranger five, and this is really where everything kind of comes together for us. So first up, we get extra attack, and making two attacks is better than one, approximately twice as good to be precise. We also get second level ranger spells. So again, always some good options, lesser restoration, pass without a trace, but the one that I'm going to focus on, as many of you have probably predicted and even asked for, is the Spike Growth spell. So, Spike Growth, as an action, and with concentration, we pick a point within 150 feet of us, and from that point, in a 20-foot radius, the ground is covered with spikes and thorns. It counts as difficult terrain, and when a creature moves into or within the area, they take 2d4 damage for every 5 feet they travel. On average, that's going to be five points of damage for every five feet, so easy to remember. They don't get any saving throw against that damage or anything. Some of you have questioned and will question whether or not the enemy has to move on their own in order to take this damage. I appreciate that that is definitely true for, say, opportunity attacks, right? We can't make an opportunity attack if an enemy is pushed away from us. They have to, like, use their movement. But I think that Wizards of the Coast has made it fairly clear that the, like, you take damage when you enter this spell effect or move through this spell effect 
works regardless of whether the movement is voluntary or not. Obviously you and or your DM may rule otherwise, but we're operating under that assumption. Okay, so spike growth. We've used this spell to great effect in the past, uh, both with Moon Druid and more recently the Sorlock Cheese Grater. I think I might be out of cards, but just in case I'm not, I guess I'll point to one of them here. Having ways to move your target and do damage to them when they move is really fun and really powerful. Now, yes, this spell has the potential to be disruptive for your party. I mean, 20 foot radius, right? That they too would potentially move more slowly through and take damage if they moved through. So you gotta be careful when you use this. You've gotta make sure you discuss your plans with your party. Don't cast it in a way that's going to frustrate and or damage your other party members, right? If it doesn't work, it's okay. We have other great concentration options. But when it does, it's awesome. And so let's get into the tactics here. It's time for a damage report, level six. Here's what the ideal combat looks like for our character right now. On round one, you cast Spike Growth. Do something fun with your bonus action. You can't cast Magic Stone yet because you already cast a spell slotted spell with your action, right? Try to get as many melee enemies as possible in the area of effect of that spike growth so that they have to wade through it and take some damage when they move up to attack. On round two, you cast Magic Stone if you need to as your bonus action and then you make two sling attacks. You get to add plus two to hit from your archery fighting style but of course a minus five to hit because you're using sharpshooter. When you hit, it's a d6 of damage thanks to Magic Stone plus four for our wisdom, plus 10 for sharpshooter. And on the first target, you use your gathered swarm to try to push them 15 feet through the spike growth, causing them to take an additional 6d4 of damage if they fail their save. This is why it was so important for us to have both our attack stat and our spell DC rely on a single ability score. So if everything works according to plan, we will do a total of 2d6 plus 6d4 plus 28 damage. What do those numbers look like? Assuming they fail their saving throw against an enemy with a 10 armor class, that's gonna be 42 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, that is 32 damage per round. And I will admit, I was a little surprised at how good that was. Comfortably in the middle of tier one builds, territory. For those who don't know, I compare my builds to one another. Check the video description for spreadsheets to see what I'm talking about. Of course, I have to admit the numbers are a little bit inflated because I'm assuming the enemy fails their saving throw. That's not always going to happen, right? But because we've been able to prioritize our wisdom for both our attack stat and our spellcasting stat, your enemies will be failing that save much more often than not. And that synergy, the high spell damage coupled with the ranged weapon attack that can benefit from the archery fighting style and sharpshooter, all while letting us use wisdom for everything, is only possible, so far as I know, if we're using a sling. And it just makes my soul sing, sing. like a tuning fork. <laughs> At level seven, with extra attack in the bag and second level spells, I wanted to briefly dip back into Druid here for a couple of important things. So we will be a Druid level two now at character level seven. At Druid two, Druids get Wild Shape, right? Which is nice. It allows us to, as an action, twice per short rest, transform into a beast with a challenge rating of one quarter or less um, that doesn't have a flying or swimming speed. It's fun, it's potentially useful, mostly for utility purposes for for us, but we actually have a, another use of our wild shape feature because since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, all druids get the feature called Wild Companion. This lets us spend a use of our wild shape and cast the Find Familiar spell without using any spell components. That's great for us, except there is one huge drawback. As opposed to lasting basically until they're destroyed, this familiar, when you cast it in this way, only lasts for a number of hours equal to half of your druid level. Arrgh! That makes me a little nuts. This is a limited resource, which requires our action to use. One hour? Come on, wizards! But here's the thing. With spike growth taking up our concentration, we're not using fairy fire anymore, and don't have another reliable source of advantage. And especially when we're using the sharpshooter feat, we benefit a lot 
from advantage. I want it back. Having a familiar, of course, helps us do that because as I've discussed often on this channel, familiars can take the help action, thereby potentially granting us advantage. For an in-depth discussion on how and whether or not that works, rules as written, etc., etc., check out the slide into my DMs episode here, and I'm gonna have to cut a different card in order to get that there. So anyway, we'll have advantage at least on one attack for that turn. That's great, but we're making two attacks in a turn. So what about the other attack? Nice segue question, Colby. Thank you. Because at level two, druids also get their druidic circle, their subclass. And we are going to take yet another subclass that I have never before used in a build, the circle of the shepherd. Not only is this subclass just perfect thematically, I think, for this build, but we also get a nice mechanical advantage as well. Here's what we read about shepherd druids. Druids of the circle of the shepherd commune with the spirits of nature, especially the spirits of beasts and the fae, and call to those spirits for aid. These druids recognize that all living things play a role in the natural world, yet they focus on protecting animals and fey creatures that have difficulty defending themselves. Shepherds, as they are known, see such creatures as their charges. They ward off monsters that threaten them, rebuke hunters who kill more prey than necessary, and prevent civilization from encroaching on rare animal habitats and on sites sacred to the fey. Many of these druids are happiest far from cities and towns, content to spend their days in the company of animals and the fey creatures of the wilds. Members of this circle become adventurers to oppose forces that threaten their charges, or to seek knowledge and power that will help them safeguard their charges better. Wherever these druids go, the spirits of the wilderness are with them. I mean, come on. Perfection, right? So, shepherd druids get a couple of features. They get speech of the woods. So beasts can now understand us and we can decipher their noises and motions. Fantastic utility, super fun, I love it. We also learn the sylvan language. And then we get the spirit totem feature. So as a bonus action, we can summon a spirit within 60 feet that gives off an aura in a 30 foot radius. We can move it later as a bonus action. It lasts for one minute, and we can do it, unfortunately, only once per short rest. Now, we can choose the type of spirit here. We have three options. Bear spirit grants us and our allies temporary hit points plus advantage on strength checks and strength saves. Nice. Unicorn spirit gives advantage to checks made to detect a creature in the aura and then lets healing spells grant more hit points. Nice. For us, however, we are going to use the hawk spirit. In addition to giving us and our allies advantage on perception checks, when a creature, including ourselves, makes an attack against a target that's in the aura, we can use our reaction to grant advantage to that attack. Very nice. So yes, now we could theoretically get advantage on one attack, thanks to our familiar, and advantage on the second attack, thanks to our hawk spirit totem. Now, sure, it costs our reaction, but I think especially as a ranged character, we're probably not going to be using our reaction a whole lot otherwise, so, so happy. At level eight, at this point, I feel like the core of the build is pretty much complete. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we could go now, but I wanna head back to Swarm Keeper for at least a few more levels for a couple of things. So yes, we are a Ranger 6 at this point, which means that we get roving from our Deft Explorer feature that tells us that we get an extra five feet of move speed and we now have a climb and swim speed equal to our walk speed, all pretty nice. And on those rare occasions that we actually use Favored Foe, it's now a D6 instead of a D4. Okay, fine, not the most amazing level, but it was worth it because at level nine, we're a ranger seven and now we can fly because we get the writhing tide feature from Swarm Keeper, which tells us that as a bonus action, proficiency bonus times per day, so four for now, you gain a fly speed of 10 feet and you can hover. It lasts for one minute. Now I know 10 feet is not amazing, but first of all, you're flying because your swarm is actually condensing and lifting you up, and just the image of that is so dang cool. And also, it still will be incredibly useful and powerful when you need it, both in combat, to keep you out of harm's way, to help you get past obstacles, survive a fall, etc., etc. So, 
super cool. Anytime we can get flight without having to concentrate on it as a spell, it's really strong. So for a damage report at level nine, the biggest thing that has changed for our damage is that I'm going to assume that we have advantage now on both of our attacks. And actually that is a fairly significant boost. The utility that we've picked up along the way as well is very welcome. But against an enemy with a 10 armor class at this level, we would be doing 49 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it's 42 damage per round on average. So Okay, we've increased, but it's definitely plateaued a little bit, right? It's still solid, and we can fly by being lifted majestically by a swarm of pixies. <laughs> so, who cares about the damage? At level 10, we're going to be ranger 8, so that we can get that ability score increase or feat. I think it's really important for us to cap our wisdom here, so we're going to be at a 20 wisdom. It just benefits everything that we do. So... I think with our wisdom capped, our flying skill secured, it might be time to leave ranger behind. You don't have to, of course. Next level, we'd get third level ranger spells. There's nothing there I don't think that we would use to increase our, st our sustained DPR. I'm not doing conjure animals. You can't make me. But there are plenty of utility and support spells there. The same can be said for Druid. Obviously, since we're already a Shepherd Druid, there is a strong argument to be made for going with the Conjured Animals route. <sighs> I'll probably do that build one day, but that's not this build. It's way too slow a start for that to suddenly become this build's focus, I think. Now, you could make an argument for fighter levels. Rune Knight, I think, feels especially like it would be a fun fit in particular, uh, or Battlemaster or even Arcane Archer if they didn't have the whole bow requirement thing. I will do an arcane archer build one day, I promise. But I want to do something to keep this build competitive with sustained damage, especially since we've kind of plateaued a bit in that department. And so I think that if I were playing this character in game, I'd probably take some rogue levels here. So at level 11, I'm going to say we are a rogue one. Methinks, perhaps, you've been spending maybe a little bit too much time with that swarm of pixies. They are awfully tricksy, aren't they? I think they've maybe been teaching you to embrace your more mischievous side, and maybe even teaching you some of their fey magic. I'm not 100% sure what the story reason for your character would be here as to why you would be taking rogue levels, but I would definitely encourage you to think about it. So as a level 1 rogue, we get Thieves' Cant, and that means that now we have both of the cool utility story purpose special languages that are unique to classes in game we also get expertise so you get to pick two more skills that you are proficient in and double your proficiency bonus with them and uh, we did gain one when we dipped rogue by the way and one when we dipped ranger so we've got a nice little list of proficiencies and expertises now for what it's worth and then of course we get sneak attack and honestly this is the main reason why we're here there are other reasons too but sneak attack is just straight up really nice way to add damage if you're making ranged attacks or attacks with finesse weapons which we are thanks sling and you have advantage on your attack which we should or the enemy is standing next to one of your allies. If you meet those criteria, you can add a 1d6 of damage to one attack per turn, and it scales. Very nice. At level 12, we'd be a rogue 2, and we get cunning action, which tells us that we can now disengage, dash, or hide as a bonus action, which is nice for us, though admittedly our bonus action is often spoken for, since, you know, ever since we got extra attack, we're going to be needing to use our bonus action to cast magic stone every other round, as it makes three pebbles. Dang pebbles. At level 13, we would be a rogue 3. Our sneak attack damage would bump up to a 3d6 and rogues get their roguish archetype, their subclass. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I think you could probably pick your favorite rogue subclass here and not see too much difference from a sustained DPR perspective. Rogue subclasses are, by and large, filled with utility features, especially at level three, with a splash of defensive abilities and rarely some potential damage increases, but those 
typically come in the form of burst options and not like sustained round over round options. I've, I've said this before, I don't really love most rogue subclasses in 5e, and that makes me sad because generally I love rogues. I think a standout though is the arcane trickster, as I've kind of hinted at. The scout would probably work well here, thematically at least for this build, and the utility and defensive options that they provide at level 3 are pretty nice, but the arcane trickster does some nice things for us. First up, we get Mage Hand Legerdemain. <laughs> mage Hand Legerdemain. And that lets us learn the Mage Hand cantrip again. But now we can use our swarmy little Mage Hand to do more cool stuff, like pick locks, disarm traps, and even pick pockets, potentially. And they get to be invisible if we want, although I wouldn't want to hide that awesome little hand swarm thing. That's hilarious. You can even use Mage Hand to do those things as a bonus action now. And this is just the best. And I hope you get to use your little swarm to, like, pick pockets all the time. You really are like the best mage hand user in game right now, I think. So have fun with that. In fact, if you've got a great mage hand story, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Inspire the rest of us on how we should be using our swarmy little mage hand ledger domain. Arcane tricksters also get to learn spells from the wizard spell list here. So we get three wizard spells and we get two other cantrips. The first level spells that we learn here have to be from the enchantment or illusion schools, aside from one, which I'll talk about in a second. Unfortunately for us, these spells use our intelligence modifier when we cast them, so I would avoid taking spells that require a spell attack or like a saving throw if you can. The standout here, I think, seems to be sleep, which just straight up works on enemies, no saving throw required. Unfortunately, it's not going to work on many, if any, full health enemies at this level, right? But that said, as my friend Corey demonstrated so effectively in our 20,000 subscriber PvP extravaganza, which I don't have a card to link to, uh, but you can check it out if you want to see it, uh, you could always use sleep on a non-full health enemy or enemies to pretty great effect. Uh, you whittle them down until their hit points are low enough and then you sleep, right? Uh, you do have fourth level spell slots now thanks to all of our multi-classing with which to potentially upcast this. It can be a little difficult to try and predict when an enemy's hit points might be low enough for them to be affected by the sleep spell, but anyway. The one that I'd especially recommend that we take here, non-illusion, non-enchantment school, is find familiar. Now, I know we already have a familiar, but as I've mentioned, it only lasts for an hour. We can only use it twice per short rest, and frankly, it might get destroyed. I like having a backup. Also, the wizard version lasts indefinitely, well, until it gets destroyed anyway, and it can be cast as a ritual. So it doesn't take a spell slot to cast it, although it does cost 10 gold in material every time you do so. It might be nice to save your druid wild shape for turning into a beast yourself if you need it. Also, it is possible that your DM might let you use two familiars to give you advantage on each of your two attacks if, say, your spirit totem has been used up that short rest or something. That might get a little tricky, rules as written, requiring one of them to like hold their action and then help as a reaction after your first attack, meaning that they wouldn't be able to fly by, meaning that they would potentially be in harm's way. Anyway, if, if that doesn't work and you have both familiars active, you could always use one to give advantage to an ally, right? And of course, as I kind of just hinted at, I definitely recommend, you know, getting a familiar with the flyby feature so that they can swoop in, take the help action, and then fly to relative safety without taking an opportunity attack, uh, something like the owl, etc. Speaking of having a backup for advantage, don't forget about the steady aim feature uh, that rogues got from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and we get that at this level. And it tells us that as a bonus action, you can give yourself advantage on your next attack this turn. Our bonus action will very often be spoken for, as I've mentioned, but if you can't get advantage on both attacks from each of your familiars and the Hawk Spirit Totem has been used, or you need to use your reaction for something else, it might be nice to have another way to secure yourself advantage. The trick with steady aim is that it only works if you haven't moved this turn, and once you use it, your speed is zero until the end of your current turn. Now, just because your speed is zero doesn't mean you can't move necessarily. 
if, for example, you wanted to use your swarm to move you instead of an enemy on that round for whatever reason. You could have it move you five feet, as we've talked about, right, after you hit an enemy. Of course, you'd be foregoing, you know, the push through spike growth on an enemy potentially, but in, in certain situations, it might be just what you need. So let's do a damage report for level 13. Uh, we are simply making two magic stone and sling attacks each turn with sharpshooter turned on with our wisdom maxed now pushing an enemy 15 feet through spike growth and making our attacks with advantage. But now we get to add 2d6 of sneak attack damage to the first attack that hits. So assuming as always that the enemy fails their strength save against your swarms push against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing 60 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it's 53 DPR. At level 14, we are a rogue four and we get an ability score increaser feat. And I'm going to recommend that we take the crusher feat. And as some of you have guessed by now, I'm sure, my original plan was to take crusher way sooner on this build. In fact, I was originally going to take it as our free feat at level one. I love that it's one more reason that the sling is the best weapon for us here because it's the only ranged weapon that innately does bludgeoning damage, right? The problem is I did the maths and the maths say that Sharpshooter is just a much stronger feat damage-wise, except at very high enemy armor class. And that's even assuming that we have a spike growth field down and that the Crusher feat would be moving the enemy through spike growth. And that won't always be the case, right? Depending on enemy position, depending on if you've like maybe lost concentration on it, or maybe you don't have the spell slot for it, or maybe it's just really inconvenient for your allies. It's a small area. I don't know. And so assuming, you know, we take sharpshooter over crusher at that point the choice became between bumping wisdom or taking crusher and the damage was pretty much identical again assuming spike growth was down and they were being pushed through it so it just felt like prioritizing wisdom was the more prudent thing to do for the sake of both our spell dc and our plus to hit and damage not to mention of course our saving throws and skill checks and things but we finally get it here and it is such a great feat you know first off it gives us a plus one to our strength or constitution so we can finally round off our 15 constitution to a 16 that's been bugging me this whole time that in and of itself actually is a not small argument in favor of taking crusher sooner but also once per turn as i've kind of already mentioned when we deal bludgeoning damage to an enemy even with a teeny tiny little magic pebble you can move them five feet in any direction you choose so long as they are no more than one size larger than you it, they, they don't get to make a save against this push and i actually like really love that image like this teeny little pebble hitting somebody boink, and like whoa <laughs> on a large creature, right? That's awesome. Also with Crusher, if you crit them, all attack rolls against them are made with advantage until the start of your next turn. So now we are potentially getting an additional five feet of movement through the spike growth on our turn, which is great and something I've been waiting for for a long time. At level 15, we would be a rogue five. Our sneak attack damage goes up to a 3d6 and we get the uncanny dodge feature, which tells us that we can use our reaction to have the damage to ourselves on one attack, which will be really nice at times, especially if we get hit by a big critical or something, right? Though you will often have your reaction spoken for thanks to our hawk spirit totem, right? So be aware of when you might need this and save your reaction in those situations. At level 16, we'd be a rogue six and we get yet another round of expertise. So pick your next two favorite skills and double your proficiency bonus with them. And then finally, for us at level 17, we would be a rogue seven. Our sneak attack damage would go up to a 4d6 and we get the evasion ability. So if we're making a dexterity saving throw to take half damage on something, a spell, a trap, etc., if we succeed on the save, it means we take no damage instead of half. And if we fail on the save, it means we take half damage instead of full. That's actually especially nice for us because our dexterity score has never been amazing. So at least we're guaranteed to only take half damage now. Don't forget, we also do get second level wizard spells now, thanks to Arcane Trickster. Just keep in mind that they do still need to be illusion or enchantment. There are some really useful ones, uh, invisibility, mirror image, pick your favorites. So for our final damage report at level 17, the only things that have changed for us are that we are now getting an extra five feet of movement through spike growth, thanks to the Crusher feet, 
and we're getting 2d6 more from sneak attack than last time we checked in. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 73 damage per round, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 65 DPR. So final thoughts. For those who don't know, I do keep like a tier ranking system for all of my sustained DPR builds. There's a tier one and tier two, and very shortly I'm gonna have to create a tier three because I'm running out of space in the graphs. It's, it's an overly simplified method of determining average damage that a build will do over all of my damage reports that I report on at all enemy armor classes. And the tier score for this character is a 47 which puts them kind of in the middle of the pack for tier two, but it is very strong early on, as I've mentioned, at the levels that most of us actually play the game. And yes, it does taper off a bit as it ages. I would say that that's actually more a result of the Ranger chassis than anything else. They just don't really scale all that well damage-wise for the most part. If you wanted to be even stronger DPR-wise with this character, you could probably start your rogue levels right after you hit Ranger 5. You'd get your advantage eventually, thanks to, you know, find familiar and steady aim like we've talked about, and your wisdom cap and your crusher feats just a tad sooner, not to mention getting a jump on your sneak attack damage, right? You would give up, of course, some utility and support functionality, most importantly, flight. But that's the mechanical stuff. At the end of the day, I love this build, maybe a little bit more than most of my other children, I think. Mostly for like the Taoist Winnie the Pooh mixed with the Fey vibe that it's got going for it. I just absolutely love. But also because of the relative power you get from being both single ability score dependent and also using the humble sling for all of your attacks throughout your career. The damage that it's capable of putting out is really quite strong. It's fairly reliable. And of course, it comes with some really nice utility and even support thanks to some of the druid ranger and even arcane trickster features i think it would be an absolute blast to play in game so i hope you enjoyed hearing about it as much as i enjoyed creating it and i hope that you get a chance to play it in game soon so that's the build for the week i love you guys thank you for watching i really appreciate it appreciate all of your support um, please continue to do all of the things, the liking and the subscribing and even joining the channel if you are so inclined. But I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again very soon. And until then, take care. And if we fail on the save, it means we take half damage instead of full. <laughs>